Okay, we are officially recording. Welcome everyone to part two of Witty Plants, Witty Native Plants. Woohoo! Exactly. Um, so just quick, quick you know, kind of recap of last week. We talked a lot about um, we talked about shade trees, we talked about flowering trees. We talked about woody understory plants, which, you know, we went from azaleas and rhodes um, to uh, viburnum. And we talked talk, talk extensively about how much I love viburnum. And then we went into uh, fall color, which if you will recall, um, is fall and winter is where I start my design process very much. Uh, because if you can pick something with a great skeleton, that's going to look beautiful in the winter that also offers other things. That's wonderful. If you can pick something with amazing fall color um, and then work your way back from there. For instance, the native dogwood has great deep purpley red leaves, but also has a spring flower and has a summer berry. So it offers berries to the birds. It has that wonderful flower that's either, depending on where you are, about to come into flower or has been flowering. I just saw some in full flower in the deep city, uh, but mine here in Arlington are still very tight. So the, you know, the dogwood is a great one. Um, the sourwood, when talking a bigger tree that has white pendulous flowers, beautiful in like June, but then it turns beautiful deep, deep red, um, like scarlet red, you know, in the fall. So that's like double season interest. Um, so we were kind of talking through that. And I think that's a good way to design. The other thing we talked about was changing the face of your landscape because people really like to, especially in front of their house, have evergreens and people rely heavily on evergreens. However, what happens with a landscape that doesn't change is we don't notice it anymore. So it's important to, you can have your evergreens, but in more times when I'm designing, I will try to put a flowering shrub in, in front of my larger evergreen shrubs, uh, or I'll do heavy perennial that will help mask those. So I can kind of temporarily forget they're there. If you recall, I used the example of boulders in the landscape and how I like to mask them with either a, say a weeping tree that will mask it for part of the year or usually heavily with uh, perennials. So you can either see part of it or not see it at all, maybe in the summertime. And then in the fall, winter and spring, there it is, especially in the winter and spring, it's like, there's that boulder. You get back to the bones of the landscape and then you see it again and it's there. But if you just have a stone, like if you just had a stone in the middle of your yard, you just you essentially after a while they stop noticing it. So when you're designing and when you're thinking about your landscape and when you're thinking about things, especially if they're going to be static, like an evergreen. Um, and yes, there are some evergreens like rhododendrons that flower, but you know you get you get that flower for a while, but for the most part, it's an evergreen. So try to think of ways that you can you know, liven up the area in front of it or make yourself forget that it's there. You know, again, one of the ways I love to use evergreen shrubs and evergreen trees is a backdrop to color because then they're just going to be green in the winter. And that's great because that's like the only color. However, if you have flowering shrubs or even just any kind of tall flower, like the Actia, the what formerly known as Semisifuga, the with the, you know, gets to be like five, six feet tall with those plumes or um, goat's beard gets to be like three, four feet tall with those plumes. So if you have those coming up in front of your, uh, your native hollies uh, or your rhododendron or whatever that might be, those are going to get nice and big, three feet high with four foot plumes. It's like you're going to forget then a little bit that that's there. So then in the fall, when those all die back, or in the winter, you'll be like, oh, okay, well, there you are. And you know, then you can appreciate it for what it is. So those were just some of the design concepts that I was trying to share um, before. And we did some of the, you know, just the, the, the imaging that we talked about and just imaging uh, a, a wooded landscape and a native landscape and what we saw and what we smelled and what we felt 
when we're in a natural native woodland or like if you go to say garden in the woods and when you're there like what you see feel and smell and then like if you're in your backyard or if you're in the city and what you see feel and smell uh, and what kind of wildlife is interacting in the are uh, in those areas so it's the idea is how can we marry the two because we don't necessarily have to be completely in the woods to have a little microcosm a little snippet of a of a garden in the woods say you know in our backyard or a coastal main botanical garden we can do that and we can get those feelings in our backyard it just ta it takes some design work uh, and it takes us to kind of um, release some of the preconceptions that we we have and we feel about our, our yard and what our yard needs to look like. We might be the one on our street that needs to kind of shake things up. Um, I you know definitely my clients are now the ones on their street who are shaking things up because they don't blow every single leaf off their property and cut every single thing down to the ground and fall and have a totally naked barren landscape. Their, their landscape's pretty twiggy, um, you know, and they still have like all the seed heads and everything left behind. But like I said, when we were talking before and just design, you know, when you're planting with those rudbeckias and those echinaceas and all those late bloomers and those late seed heads, then you get all the finches. So when you get that first dusting of snow and you have all those seed heads there, then you get all these yellow finches just all over your, all over your yard. It's like a second blooming, you know? So it's, uh, but it's, this one flits about. So it's just, it's, it's thinking like that, you know, but a lot of, a lot of my clients, it took them convincing. I had to, you know, had to talk them into, Hey, like, let's not cut everything back to the ground. And if we have to cut some things back, how about we cut them back to eight inches? You know, if it's a three foot stem and you don't want to see that, let's cut it back to eight inches so that all of those pollinators can nest inside those woody stems. And so, you know, you want these, I, we've spent all this time and money on a pollinator garden. Let's do all the things that are actually going to keep the pollinators. Like let's leave the leaves and let's leave the stems and let's not cut everything back and do a spring cleanup you know, in the very beginning of April, let's wait until it warms up so that all of those insects can come out from hiding and everything else. Otherwise they go in lawn and leaf bags and they go to the dump. And then you wonder why it's taking so long for you to up, jumpstart your pollinator garden. There's a big, there's a big circle that has to happen here. And we need to, if we really want to accomplish the butterflies flying all about and everything, we have to think about what that whole circle entails. And a lot of that comes down to host plants like we were talking about oaks and doug talamy and how like oak trees host like 400 something lepidoptera which are moth and butterfly species um before they are moths and butterflies so it's like we you know he and if you go to bringing nature home the lands the 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 landing page or the website bringing nature home the website he has the like the charts of what trees attract what and how many species so it's like it's at a glance so if you're looking for a tree or you're looking at a space and you're trying best to do it um then that's that's a site because that'll be like you know if you're like oh i want the tiger swallowtail or oh i want you know these are all things that you can do to look up you can use the western nursery plant finder uh you can use doug talamy's site you can use the native plant trust site and they will between all those three you can definitely figure out maybe either the general general attractors, or you could get things to be site specific, like we talked about the um, the spice bush and the spice bush swallowtail. Like certain things are very specific, and we went through some of that. Uh, and we talked about the big five: the oaks, the birches, the willows. <clears throat> that was all. That was all. Um, all last week, if you recall. Uh, and if need be, if you would like, send Melissa, um, the, what did I say? Oaks, willows, cherries, maples. Oaks, willow, cherry, birches, and maples. Sorry, I kind of forgot where I was, where I was in all that. So those are all the, all the ones we, um, you're going to look for. If you were just looking for the big five, we can get you those lists out. But again, like those, those three sites that I just sent you to, we're great. 
the other thing we talked about, and then I'll get into our, everything where we're going, because I know we only got like an hour and a half and I'm going to need every minute of it. And I'm already eating up a lot of it. So I apologize, but there's a lot I want to tell you because you need to know this stuff so you can tell your friends and it's important. So um, the other thing we talked about was just um, host plants and things being eaten or decimated and things being nibbled. Things being nibbled are fine. That's what we want. That's a good thing. That's the circle of life. Herbivores need to eat herbaceous things. That's what they do. Um, so, and it's, and it's better that the rabbits are eating the clover and, you know, not our dog. So we want to keep it that way. So let's, let's let the rabbits eat the clovers. Let the herbivores eat the herbivores and the, you know, the carnivores eat the, car you know, eat the, eat the meat. So, but it's okay if your native plants especially get browsed or get nibbled on by certain things. That's what we want. That's how we get all those native insects and birds and stuff that we like. Because if we have the insects, then we have the birds. And I can't remember the number. I want to say it's like 10,000 caterpillars, caterpillars or something like that. It's a, it, again, it's another Doug Tallamy thing, but it's like a chickadee needs like 10,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch, which is five birds. Like that's a lot of caterpillars. So in which case we need to, we need to make sure that we plant those plants for those caterpillars. So that's kind of where this whole part of this whole talk leads is bringing birds, bringing insects, bringing wildlife to our backyard. The rest of it is most often I'm trying to dispel the myth that native plants um, are messy. Native plants aren't sexy. Native plants aren't, so they really are. So I'm really, I'm really trying to show you that you don't necessarily need to always go to the exotics to have this beautiful flowering, interesting landscape. There are plenty of native plants that can get us there. And especially like when it comes to trees and shrubs and, and the like, there are plenty of ways that we can get there. We don't always have to go to the exotics. Now, if you use, again, going back to Doug Tallamy, Doug Tallamy is like, uh, I think he's 70, 30 or 80, 20 in his landscape, 80% native, 20% exotic. Um, or maybe he's 70, 30 and, and I'm 80, 20. Um, but in there is fine. As long as you're, as long as you're native heavy, it's absolutely fine. Um, I think I outed myself before. One of my favorite small trees is Hepticodium, seven sunflower. It's got exfoliating bark, awesome for the winter. It blooms in like August when nothing else is in bloom because it's like in between bloom times. Love that. Those blooms then turn to these brilliant red sepals that kind of go into fall. Love that. It's like such a, it's an off time. If you're into music or jazz or whatever, it's like, it's that, it's like that off time drumming. It's just, it's perfect because that plant is just out of sync with everything else we have going on that it provides interest. And you're like, when everything else is kind of like, nah, at the end of the summer or, you know, in that downtime, this thing's in its glory. And it's like, oh, wow, look at that. And it really shows up because of that. Um, so, and that's not a native, but it's, it's one that I like. So if you follow that 80-20, you could put something like that in there. If you follow that 80-20, you could put in something like a stewardia, as long as you have things like these viburnums, like these witch hazels, like these hydrangea, all these other, like the, um, the calicanthus, the sweet shrub with those deep red, like that's one of my favorite shade plants, deep, deep red flowers, fragrant, and it's a butterfly, a butterfly host plant and a tractor. It's like, it's a great one. So those are just all the things to think about. Those are some sites for you. Today, we start off by asking Melissa to make me able to share my screen. And then once I'm able to share my screen, Done. Thank you. Sorry, should have done it before. No, nope, it's all good. No need to apologize. You're the best. And then so from here, and if you recall today, we start with eating. So this is one of the cool things about the landscape. This is one of the cool things. I think I touched on it a little bit before. 
um, the ability to use, we talked about, I think I did I tell you guys, talk to you guys about chocolate dip tulips a little bit and lilacs and lilac syrup. So eating is really fun. Um, and there are a lot of natives that can grow in our landscape that can be very pretty, that can also provide either fun food for us or just fun food for wildlife. So we will go over uh, some of those things. Give me one second, my click is not connected. All right, so Amelanchia, this is, or the service berry, so-called because it blooms around now, which is said, this is one of the, the, I guess, the theories on why it's called service berry. It's the one that I learned. Uh, it let you know that in the colonial times that the ground was thought enough to hold services for your loved ones who passed over the winter uh, because it is an early bloomer. However, service berry is great because it is sun to shade. Uh, it gets thin, just like the trees that we talked about um, last week. It gets thinner in the shade and, and the flowering is not as robust, but it can grow there. Um, usually is in a multi-trunk vase shape form, gets to be about 15, 20 feet high. If you recall, each story is 10 feet. So 20 feet ultimately gets to the top of your or mid of your second story of your house. 30 feet is usually the pitch of the house. So when you're looking at these things and you see 15 feet, that's gonna get ultimately in about 10 years to about halfway up your second story window. <clears throat> or it might top off at just below the uh, below your second story window. But Amelanchia is great. Like I said, it's in bloom now. It's a, it's a native. It's becoming a very popular native. It's showing up in like all the new residences and condo complexes that are um, that are popping up. There must be a native requirement and that's the one that everybody's finding. Like I said, tough plant, sun to shade. The more sun you get, the more of these berries you get. These berries, if you can get to them before the birds do, are absolutely delicious. I think I described doing a hedgerow with service berry on either side of the walkway and then a hedge of high bush blueberry. And in just two trees, my client is able to have plenty for the birds and make six pies to share with the neighborhood. So uh, they do service berry pie that they, they make in June. These are what they look like. They're absolutely delicious. Plus it's got gorgeous fall color. So you had to know I was going there. Spring flower, summer berry, fall color. That is a Trevor Smith shrub for sure. There are multiple kinds, but you can see there it is in flower. Some are taller than others. Some are like there's one called October Brilliance that you'll probably find at Western Nurseries. That is just as it says. That was that was bred for its uh, for its fall color, and it has amazing fall color. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> the Allegheny uh, Amelanchia has the tastiest fruit. It has the sweetest fruit. So if you are growing a food forest or you want that, you know, you're trying to get the tastiest, tastiest berries, then this is the one for you. It gets to be ultimately 30 feet tall. So that's gonna be way up in your, your, second, your second story, tasting your third story. Ultimately, this is, you know, in a, in a 20 year span. So if you get it at six feet, then eventually it's going to get that high. <clears throat> Amelanchia canadensis. This is the one that you find more often. Um, 10 to 18. This is the more accessible landscape shrub. Uh, this one, again, I love this one because it is like a small tree. This can go into almost any yard, any landscape. It can go into your tree line. If you have like an open wooded area or an, a, something that you don't necessarily want to look at, it provides a good filtered screen. So when we were talking last week about using evergreen shrubs, like um, we'll just say like an arborvitae, like the native arborvitae, the, the dark American arborvitae, it's a big, a big tree uh, or the, the techni, the mission arborvitae is a little bit shorter. Um, but if you're trying to do that screen, you put those evergreens in like the, the major sight line 
And then you put something like this next to it or in between. So you're not to your neighbor and to the rest of the world, you're not creating this wall of green. You have this alternating hedgerow. So you'll have this green that blocks the screen, but then you have something like this that's gonna get 20 feet tall. And during the summer, really when it's in leaf and in flower and everything, it's gonna filter. It's not gonna block like a wall, but it'll filter your screen. Now you can see these get like a little leggy at the bottom. So you're gonna need either other shrubs or some perennials to kind of cover those, cover the legs. But you can filter screen with uh, viburnum that we talked about. And when we talked about river birch, like those are things when you're doing a, uh, when I do a hedgerow, when I do a screen planting, I don't line up a bunch of green soldiers, I mix. And I use those evergreens as backdrops to the flower, to the foli foliage. And then in the winter, when you're not outside and it, like all that wall isn't necessary, then it's okay. Because then it's just like, a, again, it's filtered with the, with the twigs. But always putting the evergreen in the, in the sight line that bothers you most. So if you're looking outside your kitchen window and boom, there's your neighbor, well, put the evergreen there. And then on one side, put a, like a river birch. On the other side, put an amelanchia. And then with all that different branching and that food, you're going to have birds and everything all through there. You're going to have, have this habitat going in this hedgerow. Grandifolia, this is a hybrid of the two. So it's a little bit taller, lots and lots of flower. <clears throat> so taller than the, taller than the canadensis, but uh, has that, has that, um, all that flower and the sweeter fruit all things to check into. This is an alternative tree that I've been pushing for some time. You may or may not know it. I find if you are not from here and you are from like say the Midwest, then you definitely know this one. The pawpaw uh, was a favorite of the Native Americans. It's an excellent shade tree. It grows kind of like aspens. So like if you planted three, in like 10, 20 years, you'll have a grove because it keeps putting up little trees around the mother plant. So you get this wonderful grove. It's pollinated by flies, which is, which is interesting and different. And it has this wonderful gold fall color. But the thing about the pawpaw is this, is the fruit. And it is one of the largest fruiting plants here uh, in the Northeast that I know of, fruiting trees like this. It has these pods that are, oops, that are absolute, they're, they're just amazing. They are like a mango vanilla custard inside. Um, and they were extremely popular back in colonial times um, and still kind of grown like in Ohio in the Midwest or in the out, out when you start getting that way, people are still familiar with them. Um, but once fruit production, and food production became like they don't they don't keep well, so they couldn't travel well, so they just kind of fell out of favor because they weren't reliable enough. But this is a great one that I always try to get going. And if you have a shady area, getting a couple of these. So for instance, my mo one of my most recent designs from last year using these is I had a client that wanted to wanted to produce more food, but they had this area in their yard where the fence came together. It was just a shady corner of the yard too shady for grass to grow, got some light though. I mean, it did get light. So we just figured we'd start a pawpaw grove there. It got like four or five hours of sunlight and more if it got taller, but there was plenty for pawpaws to get started. And there was plenty of room and just kind of dead space. So say in 20 years, these things became like a full on grove. It would have been absolutely awesome. So this is like an alternative. It takes a little while for it to start fruiting. But once it goes and once it starts fruiting, you just kind of like wow people. Um, I am going to let you know right now that I do. I think you gathered from the last talk. I do do. I'm a am very, very amateur forager. I like playing around with things in the landscape. Um, I certainly don't spend my weekends mushroom hunting or anything like that. It's something that I would love to do, but I don't find the time. Um, and I'm certainly not that committed because the worst thing to do would be to go out, get all this stuff and then be too busy to use it and have it die. So <laughs> I certainly am not or have it rot out. Um, so I'm certainly not like that. I know, I know my limits. <clears throat> uh, so Jersey tea, this is a, this is a great one. This is what was used um, 
when the tea was not available in colonial times. So this can this actually can be used to brew a tea esque beverage. Uh, makes for a great sun to part shade shrub. You can see it gets to be about four by maybe five by five uh, with a fun uh, with a fun white flower in the summer. American hazelnut. We talked about this one's great. I like this for a number of reasons. Great fall color. These I actually um, did a wedding where I used these as a boutonniere. They were a um, a very natural couple. And I was trying to come up with something fun and natural. So we use these because they come up, they, the, the nuts form in these little clusters. So we did all the boutonnieres in these, in these little clusters. Anyhow, I digress. Fun nut. So if you're looking to have nut production or whatever, this is, uh, this is a good one. It's like a eight by eight foot shrub, I think. Um, hazelnut, you know, which is great, but kind of neat fall color and it's a host plant. So it's definitely a fun co color, uh, definitely reliable producer. Host plant, which like we talked about is great. So you can't really go wrong with this one. And, you know, if you were to just, if you are doing to like say cut flowers or something, cutting these while they're in that middle stage uh, adds interesting texture and stuff to a bouquet uh, while you're using, while, while you're going with that. American persimmon, another edible. Super, again, super cool, kind of fell out of favor. Uh, you don't find too many persimmon. Um, but if you like any sort of, uh, if you have any of your grandmother's cookbooks or grandfather's cookbooks, whoever had, whoever did the cooking, uh, any of the old recipes from the old days, you definitely have the persimmon. Not a huge tree, about a 15 foot ish tree, if I recall. Um, great fall color. And then you have all the persimmons. Needs a little bit more love. Not like the hazelnut, you can just kind of plant in your landscape and it's a cool shrub. Persimmon will definitely need pruning like a fruit tree, but uh, super cool, native, reliable, uh, and habitat friendly. But that's more if you're committed to the fruit. Another one that if you are committed to the fruit is the mulberry. People have a love and hate with the mulberry. Um, because the fruits are beautiful, the fruits are sweet, the fruits are prolific and messy when they begin to drop. So if you ever grew up with a mulberry or have been around a mulberry, um, these trees get pretty tall, 30 feet tall or so. Um, and like I said, they're extremely prolific. So once they start dropping, they drop a lot of berries. Birds love them, wildlife absolutely loves them. So it's a great habitat value. Um, but those who have I've seen like planted next to a, next to a driveway, that driveway is just a mess and you can't park your car under it. So don't put it next to your driveway. Uh, put it in a place if you have a big area, a big field, a big whatever it might be, space for a big tree, this is a good one to have. Mulberries are fun. They're tasty. Again, show up a lot in old recipes. <clears throat> the beach plum. <clears throat> this is pretty easy. Um, does want the sandy soil, can take the salty air, can take the beating from the winds, because we talked about the, uh, the red bud, how the red bud doesn't take, the, doesn't take the wind very well. The beach plum can take some pretty extreme conditions. Um, not a big tree, about 15 feet, and does, does produce uh, very sweet and delicious fruits. <clears throat> Of course, just with everything else in the in the prunus family, like we were talking about in the big five, it's got that nice white flower in the spring and then the fruits, but it also is a wonderful host plant and produces these wonderful little fruits that we were talking about. <clears throat> so that's a good one with a nice fall color. So if you have sandy soil, uh, this would be this would be a way to go. So this doesn't just grow anywhere. You have to think it's in the name. It's a beach plum, so it wants quick draining, evenly moist soils. So I don't know what your, what your worlds look like. Raspberries, black raspberries, thimbleberries, um, everybody in this family, excellent, delicious. I suggest putting them in raised beds because they, can, they will run. So I suggest putting them in a bed or putting them somewhere that you can keep them contained so they don't find their way out into your lawn 
or elsewhere in the landscape. Um, but extremely easy to grow, extremely easy to prune, and you can get, even if the birds get at them, you can usually get um, a pretty good haul for yourself. And who doesn't like fresh berries, either on their cereal, in their yogurt, in a, in a, be in a beverage, like, or just kind of in the summertime, going out and grabbing some because they're there in your yard. <clears throat> But again, you need to, for these, it's good to create a bed and uh, make it a bed just for them so that you can keep them contained and happy. This is, a, you know, this is an image of a raspberry patch being started, not in a raised bed. Like I said, I like a raised bed a little bit more, but if you're looking to start this, that's fine. I would also, soon after this, would put up the, um, or put up, uh, trellises or like stakes with with um, with climbing wires to kind of keep them tied to and keep them uh, keep them going. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah, I just was curious. Do you have to water raspberries initially, though? I mean, I know you have to water everything initially, but I mean, like it just seems like something that needs a lot of water. And I wasn't sure if that's accurate or if it's just my perception. If you put your raspberries in a high organic soil and mulch them in, after the initial phase, you'll be fine. You need to get them established, but if they're in a highly organic soil and you love on them, I mean, the more water, they're a berry, so they need water to make that happen. Anything fruiting, if you really wanna have it there, not too, too much, because then you get saturated berries and you lose some of the sweetness but it's not like you have to keep these things saturated all the time they're less maintenance than say a tomato which needs a gallon a day um <clears throat> then we have the black raspberries or what i was when i grew up they i called them thimble berries the little teeny tiny ones there you often see these growing on like the roadside or in some sort of sunny marginal area and the transition between the the grass and the woods is where you usually find these um you know these are just a really fun fruit not as upright and contained as say a raspberry or a blackberry these tend to arch a little more with their canes but they're also smaller um but definitely yummy to work into it and then of course we have the blackberries and if you have never picked a blackberry on a summer day and just eaten it right then and there, uh, you have certainly missed out because that is a flavor explosion like, like no other. <clears throat> and then the flowering raspberry, this is a super cool shrub. Um, gets pretty big, but uh, it's an herbaceous, it's, it's more of an herbaceous shrub, easy to keep maintained. But again, it feels like if you have a part sun corner, sun to part sun corner, if you have an east corner that something gets morning sun, say till noon, but not in the afternoon, and you need something to just fill out that area, this is perfect for that. Um, it, it can be a corner as in like the corner of your house, like maybe your entryway in one of the wings and there's like this just dead space and you could put a viburnum there, but maybe you wanna do something different or it could be a corner or in like along a bed. Like if you have a long wall uh, for a perennial bed and you need something to just kind of interrupt that, this is perfect. Um, just kind of plop it in there and just let something get really big and swallow the whole bed while you have all your perennials and stuff on, on either side or as an, as an end, as a point piece at one end of the bed or the other. If you're a little more symmetrical and don't like things to just kind of disrupt linear patterns. Um, that this is a this is a good one for that, but very easy to grow. Sambucus canadensis. This is something that I absolutely uh, harvest every year and usually give give away to friends, and then they reward me with all sorts of shrubs and elixirs. And I have a lot of chef friends, so they do really cool things and and get all my blackberries back to me. Um, this is if you have a moist area because. Sambuca likes, for the most part, a moist soil. Spring flower, or we'll call it a late, late spring, early summer flower, 
which then in like June, July turns to these um, black or red berries, 10 to 15 foot high shrub will fill out nice. But if you have moist soils, if you have a high water table uh, or any of the like, this is a great one. It's a great one for the woodland. Um, I don't know about it as like a standalone, uh, if, but if it has some supporting characters around it, then it's excellent. Uh, like for instance, the shape in that picture, like if once it gets like that shape, if it has some supporting characters around it um, to kind of hide it, to hide its legs and, and or its lopsidedness, because sometimes they're not perfect growers, um, then, it's, uh, then it's absolutely excellent. Blueberries, especially the high bush blueberry uh, is something that I use, well, I use both in just the landscape in general, not even trying to be an edible landscape. I love the high bush blueberry. It gets to be like uh, five feet, six feet high. Ultimately, um, it's got that blueberry spring flower. It has the berry. Um, if you're not planning on getting the berries, then the birds get the berries, but they have gorgeous red fall foliage. Same with the, um, the low bush blueberry, the ground runner. We'll take it dry, we'll take it semi-moist, likes a nice acidic soil. So if you have oaks and pines and a sunny area, eventually you can get the low bush blueberry to just take off in a carpet. Um, and it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It takes a little patience for it to get there, but once it gets going, if it has enough sun uh, and it has enough organic matter, it will just kind of take off in a carpet and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I am actually working on a job right now in Cohasset. Um, and we are doing a, a blueberry hedge. So when you're, just, when you're doing high bush blueberries, you need to have, um, you want to have at least three different varieties. And it's best to have a early, mid and late burying variety. Um, so I try to plant them in fives or sevens, um, if possible. Uh, you space them about four or five feet apart, which makes them a great hedge. Um, if you want to just kind of create a grove or a cluster, nothing says that you have to space them five feet apart. If you're not a farmer production, then it really doesn't matter. You could space, like make a triangle of them and, or two triangles, like in a bed. If you had a, say you have a flower bed, on either side, you could do plant six, you know, mid, early, late in a, I guess it would probably be like in a six foot, eight foot circle, you know, and that would be the end of the bed. And you'd have this five foot blueberry tower on, on, on the end of the bed, maybe with a path through it to the other side of the yard and then have your flower beds down either side. Um, or you could plant them in a hedge uh, and they do just fine. There's plenty of ways to use these in the landscape aside from the berries. But if you want to have great berry production, you need at least three different kinds. Um, and it's good to have, like I said, I like to do fives and sevens. So I usually get like, I have my throw, I, pay, I judge by the client what the throwaway time is. So if they are going to be out and about and probably not caring so much about the landscape come like midsummer then I put in like one late bloomer and I focus more on the, on the spring and mids. If it's vice versa and they're late, they got, say they got a lot of kids or a lot of responsibility up until June, then maybe I, I switch it up and go the other way. I usually plant heavy on the middle bloom though, or the middle berry. Cranberries, cranberries are a thing. Cranberries don't necessarily need a bog. You don't have to have a swamp to have a cranberry. You can have a high water table for the large cranberry right here. Again, if you can grow the Sambuca, if you have, this is a great, this is a cool ground cover. Um, and if you can have a high water table and some sandy soil, you're good. You don't need, cranberries grew before we made special bogs for them. However, the large cranberry does need a high water table where the mountain cranberry does not. <clears throat> mountain cranberry does just fine um, in moist soils and a little harsher environments. It's smaller, lower to the ground, lower, um, you know, smaller fruit and lower burying, 
but you get this cool ground cover. This is why I use these. I use them for landscape purposes, not for necessarily harvesting. If you can get a little harvest out of them, that's cool, but it makes for a funky ground, ground cover. So then we get to built landscapes. And this is what I see often. This is, this is what we uh, deal with. What you're looking at here are shrubs that were put in a long time ago and then pruned to keep fitting the space. And this may be somewhat what your house looks like. Um, some of these shrubs have been pruned like the yews in the background here have been pruned like that so long that there's really no going back and no fixing them. The needles are just on the very outer edge and it is just sticks on the inside. Um, so there's really no fixing that. Like this is something that ultimately needs to come out. It was not loved. It was just improperly maintained. Um, so these shrubs are very skeletal and naked on the inside because somebody's just been shearing them for about 20 years or so. So six million ways to die or how to kill a tree. This is something we all should definitely know. So I'm gonna go through all the ways that you can kill a tree. Because if you know all the ways not to do it, then you will know how to do it right. But once you know all the ways not to do it, you are not going to be able to look at a lot of landscapes the same again. So just be warned. If... So topping the tree. This I see happen a lot when people buy trees that are small, not looking at their ultimate size, and then the tree gets to be towards its ultimate size. Oftentimes this happens with river birch. You'll notice it a lot now that I've said that, but river birch want to be 30, 40 feet high. Most people top them at 20 feet. This is not good for the longevity of the tree. It encourages water sprouts. <clears throat> Leaving co-dominant leaders. When buying a tree, you do not want a tree with two leaders. You want a tree that has one definite center leader, it's called, or trunk. If you have two like this, just leave that one. That's not the one that you want. Or you're going to have to prune it. You know, if you get a tree like that, you'll have to prune it so there's only one leader. A tree needs to be that way so it will, uh, it will not V out and it can, it can grow balanced and proper. Uh, and again, like right here, it makes it very susceptible to, to wind damage. So we're talking about the longevity of trees. Cross branches. The simplest of one of the first things I teach all of the crews in pruning, whether it's pruning shrubs or pruning trees, is take out all the cross branches because that's the easiest one to notice. You know, you look into the tree or you look into your shrub and anything that's crossed over, just either take one or take them both. Because if they rub, then there's a wound. They think of it like a blister. And if it stays raw too long, something bad is bound to happen. <clears throat> Ignoring disease or insect damage. Now, like we talked about, some insect damage is okay. There is an, a, an acceptable threshold of damage. So... Nibbling is fine, decimation is not. But decimation usually means that your, your tree itself, the immune system is down. So then you need to figure out what, what is happening. However, when it comes to things like hemlock, hemlock gets a, a scale disease called woolly adulgid. So if you have hemlocks, chances are you spray for your hemlocks. What usually happens is I come on a property and the hemlock is like on death's door and they're like, I don't, these things just don't look great. And I'm like, for it to look like this, it hasn't been looking great for like five years plus. So noticing these things or being proactive, because if you have a hemlock, it's going to get sick. So just be proactive with the spray. If you want hemlocks, you want to keep your hemlocks, you want to plant with hemlocks because they are beautiful, but you're there, you are not going to escape woolly adulgent. Um, do not paint or seal. It is a product. There's a lot of racket in the, in the business. Trees like people can heal themselves. They do not need to, you don't need to paint the wound from a pruning cut or anything else. It's just going to slow the healing process. Let it do its thing. 
Leaving broken branches unpruned. This is fine out in the wild natural landscape, but if there is a broken branch and you leave that wound unpruned, it can lead to further damage. It can lead to um, a, a entry point for pests and things that you don't want. Like I said, this is fine in the forest and I'd leave it alone. But when it's a, an ornamental tree in your yard and it's what you have, then if a branch breaks over the winter, then you need to give it a nice clean cut. Spraying, spraying herbicides in the root zone. This goes for like a lot with lawn care as well. If you're putting down all these herbicides to kill broadleaf things in your lawn, that will have an effect. It may not, it's not gonna kill your tree right away, but it is going to weaken your tree. It's an herbicide. The tree's an herb. You're siding your herb slowly. It's slow, it's, de it's, death, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's a slow killer. So think about what you're treating your lawn with. Think about what you treat your beds with because anything you put down that is going to kill a plant is slowly going to kill your tree. It's just a bigger, it's a bigger beast. So it takes more to kill it or it's going to weaken the tree and leave it susceptible to insects and fungal damage. Damaging the roots with lawn equipment. I think I say this every talk and you'll probably, if you haven't, if I haven't said it already, I will say it again. Lawn guys, we can't always control when they come or what they do, but oftentimes they come when the ground is wet. So the best thing you can do for yourself and for your landscape is to not run your irrigation when the lawn companies are coming, because they're going to drive all over your landscape no matter what. If your sprinklers go off at four and they arrive there at eight, that top inch or so of your lawn is still wet and they're going to compact your soil. Compacted soil is the enemy of anything living. It's the enemy of anything living in the soil, and it's the enemy of all the plants trying to live in your soil. That said, too, it is your responsibility to point out, especially if you care about the trees and the things in your landscape, to be very careful if you have landscape equipment coming on. If you have a landscape project happening, you need to make sure that you make your landscaper aware that you care about the root zone of the tree because otherwise they may store a big pallet of heavy stones under your tree. They may park a bobcat under your tree. All of these things will kill your tree, not right away. It'll start happening like three to five years later and you're not gonna really understand what's going on. If your tree ever starts dying from the top down, that is something that could have happened. Cutting through the root zone when trenching. Roots can take some cutting. If you have to cut the roots, it's good to cut them clean so that they can heal. If you go at them, say with an excavator, or if you have a raggedy cut on a root, that is an open wound that could lead to, if it doesn't heal properly, it could lead to a problem. Planting too close to the house, we talked about. Check the, check the ultimate size of your tree or shrub. You may be getting it as a two by two, but if it wants to be a 10 by 10 or a 30 foot tall, then you need to be aware of that. Nailing things into your trees is actually harmful. Trees don't like to have nails stuck into them. Sometimes we do that, sometimes we have to do that. It doesn't mean you're gonna kill them, but it's not gonna make your tree happy. Randomly pruning and leaving stubs. I see this all the time where like somebody went and they cut a, they cut a branch to the length that they wanted. And then there's like four inches of a little stub sticking out, nowhere near a leaf, a leaf node or the next branch. You wanna cut as close to the leaf node which is the little kind of bumps on the trunk or the next branch. And you wanna cut at a 45 degree angle. That's just real simple, like dirty pruning. Just follow it back. If you want it, if you want to like take the big piece of this branch off, then find where that other side branch is and cut a quarter inch or so above that at a 45 degree angle. And you usually can't go wrong. Pruning can get a lot more detailed than that, but by leaving like a four to six inch just kind of stub out there with nothing going on is not healthy for the tree. Leaving tree stakes and guy wires. I, told, I think I told you before, I am not a, uh, a fan or a practitioner of tree stakes and guy wires. I use them in urban plantings when there's a lot of wind whipping between buildings down a street and the tree will blow over. Anytime there's a wind gust area that will blow a tree over, you want your tree to experience wind. That's how it grows its roots. It grows its roots to compensate for where the wind comes from. So by taking that away, 
it's not going to ever learn how to balance. It has to learn how to balance. And it's going to learn how to balance by feeling the wind push on it. And then it'll grow its roots to compensate, knowing that the wind comes from that direction. So, but by leaving them on, not only do you kind of kind of, you know, if you need to have them on while the tree gets established, fine. By leaving it there, you see oftentimes the tree kind of grows around that. And that's what happens a lot with landscapers. They put them on and they just forget about them. Leaving tree wraps on, sometimes people put tree wraps on to prevent uh, nibbling and things in the winter or to prevent, wi wi prevent winter scald on young trees. That's fine, but you can't just set it and forget it. The other one is putting the tree, the tree bags on the tree and just setting it and forgetting it. Then you create this moist environment uh, and the bark wants to be dry. You don't want to have this moist environment. Think of your skin. You know, it's, that's why I always relate plants to people because if you think about your skin always being moist, bad things happen. Um, you know, if you were in wet socks all the time, bad things would happen to your feet. Excessive mulching, volcano mulching is a terrible thing. We talked about the root flare. If you can't see the root flare, there is an issue, there's a problem. You never want to mulch over the root flare. You want to keep all mulch four inches away from the trunk itself. Putting weed control or in the root zone area, not a good thing. It prevents water from getting in. It prevents respiration of the soil. Weed cloth and weed plastics, I am not a fan of. Leaving the ball lacing on the trunk, <clears throat> ball lacing, burlap, all of these things have been treated with chemicals so not to rot and they will eat into the trunk. The, the burlap that goes around the root balls is actually treated with a root retardant. So your roots aren't going to grow out. They put a root retardant on it so that it can sit in a nursery for an entire season and not root into the ground. But then what happens is most landscapers just take it and drop it in and everybody thinks, oh, the burlap will decompose. No, the burlap will take a long time to decompose because it's been dipped in chemicals. So it doesn't decompose right away. And it's dipped in chemicals to keep the roots from wanting to grow. So if you want to plant a tree, you want the roots to grow. Sounds real basic, but more often than not, not, I see landscapers leave the burlap on the trees. So here is a mulch volcano that I am talking about. We do not want to see this ever. We see it at the big box stores all the time. This is something that I can't believe because since I got in this game 20 years ago, we've been talking about mulch volcanoes and mulch volcanoes are still happening. If you can't see the root flare, there's a problem. That tree wrap that I was talking about, great to put on to prevent winter burn and sun scald and sometimes some vole damage, but you can't leave it on. Just like you wouldn't leave a Band-Aid or an ACE bandage on you forever, you can't leave that on. Leaving the basket on. This is, some of the, this is one of the worst offenders. People leave the baskets on all the time. Chances are if you're driving through your downtown and all the trees downtown are dying from the, the top down, it's because they left the basket on the tree and it's now girdled itself, meaning it's, it's, it's choked itself off and it can't get nutrients all the way to the top. I have found trees, some that have lived a very long time. I pulled out like a, a 15, almost 20 year old tree, I think in, um, in downtown Boston, but it still had the basket on it. So it just, it just muscled through and it actually didn't kill it. That being said, I've also gone to the nursery and seen trees dead from the top down, still in their burlap, still in their basket. Some landscaper just having to replace some trees that didn't make it the first time. As I talked about, take off that burlap, especially the synthetic burlap, but even the, the organic looking burlap has been treated. Um, don't over remediate your backfill. My biggest thing with planting is you need to you want to amend the soil. So if you, if you think, think about planting, like sending your child to a new play group or kindergarten, if you sent your child into a new group of friends, which is like the soil into a new environment, and you sent that child with like a bunch of cookies or something for everybody, instant instant game, instant party pleaser. Everybody's gonna wanna, wanna be friends with your kid because they came with cookies. If you amend the soil with a soil amendment like an organic plant magic, like a plant tone, 
um, something something that's going to put essential uh, inoculants and minerals in the soil to help the plant get started, great. Fertilizer, not so much. A lot of peat moss, peat moss, first of all, isn't sustainable. And having a lot of peat moss and compost in the hole isn't going to help. Because if you make the hole too sweet, then the roots aren't going to want to grow out of there. Think of it like, again, like children, if it's, if it's too sweet and it's too good and you're always doing the dishes and the laundry and everything, they're never going to want to leave. So if you give it just a little bit, you make it sweet so they can get started, but they grow out into the native soil, then they'll get bigger, deeper, better root systems. And then they can fend for themselves out in the world. You need to kind of parent your, parent your plants like you parent your kids. Again, compacting the root zones. Don't store materials in the root zones. Don't operate machinery in the root zones. Chances are many of you on here probably aren't wheeling bobcats around your property. However, you may have somebody come and do that. And depending on the professional you have and come and do that, they may or might, may not do that responsibly. This is something I have a broken record when I'm working with landscape construction crews on doing this and, and the like. When I show up for a console, when I'm show up as a, uh, as a consultant, with a, with a new designer that I've never worked with. I, first of all, I ask him like, what are, you, what are your paths here? Cause I like to have like one path or a pretty strict area that the crews move in, the materials move in, the machines move in. So that you're, if you're going around the house, you're going the same way all the time, using the same path all the time. Instead of just going this way, then this way, then backing up and all over. Cause then it's just unnecessary compaction. So I'm gonna teach you about the CRZ. You're going to bring up the, if you are a homeowner and not a landscape professional already, <clears throat> or if you are a designer and you are hiring landscape professionals, you should ask them about the CRZ because if they know about the CRZ, then they definitely know what's up. If not, they may have an idea and they may just not know what's called this, but this is one of those ways that you can let somebody know that you know what you're talking about and that they better be on their best behavior. So the CRZ is the critical root zone. What you do is you take the diameter of the tree at breast height. So at about four, four and a half feet, you take the diameter of the tree and the no-go zone is 12 inches for every inch in diameter. So if it's a one inch diameter tree, you need to keep a no-go zone 12 inches around that. So for every, for every one inch diameter, you need to go out 12 inches. So if you have a big, beautiful, like 12 inch round tree or something, that's gonna be a very big CRZ. But if you compact that area, you risk the tree. This is sometimes very inconvenient. It's not about convenience all the time, it's about life. So sometimes we have to mend our plans and do our things so we don't kill a tree that's been there since before we were born. If that tree is important to you. Like I said, it's not going to die right away. So you won't be, may not, may not even think to tie it back to the landscape work you had. But this is the stuff that I see. Guy wires that have been left on too long and that are now choking out the tree. That shortens the life of the tree. Trees that are thrown out in the nursery with the baskets and the burlap still on. That's why the tree died. And you may or may not have to pay for that tree a second time. Depending on the landscape company you deal with, depending if you get the same landscape company twice, depending on, you know, depending on who you hire, you may have to buy that tree again. You may put a tree in your front yard. It may get put in with burlap and basket, die in three years or even a year, and it won't be covered under a warranty or anything else. And then you'll have to buy it again. And the problem is it wasn't planted right the first time. So it's very important that you have this knowledge as a designer, you have this knowledge as a homeowner, because this is how you're going to get the landscape that you want. This is how it's going to look like it does in your mind. When you get the right plant in the right place for the right reason, then that's, that's the first step and that gets it there, but it has to go in the right way. And to do that, you need somebody who knows about planting. It's, it's just that simple because the way the world is right now, there are those of us, there are those who know plants and planting, and there are those who don't. 
and not everybody can be expected to know everything, but plants and planting, and those of you are, who are on here should be feel pretty privileged because understanding plants and understanding planting or even wanting to is like, it's a dying language. You're really keeping something alive because we're, as a, as a, a human community, as a human culture, we're really losing touch with this and we're forgetting it. And the names of plants we're forgetting. So if you're on here and you're doing this, you're definitely, you know, you're, you're, one, you're ones that are keeping, keeping the fires burning. So built environment. <clears throat> These are the tough plants for the tough places. The speckled alder, if you're looking for trees, good plant, tough plant, tough place. Um, full sun and can, can take a variety of soils. Can definitely take the abuse. Um, I can't off the hand right now, I'm sorry. I can't think of how high it gets, um, which is terrible. In this picture, it looks like about 25, 30 feet tall. Um, I usually remember all of these things, but I've now just blanked on that one. <clears throat> Bottle brush buckeye. Okay, this is one of my favorites, so I can tell you all about this. This one is a huge swallowtail attractor. This is a 10 by 10 shrub, full sun to part shade, gorgeous white flowers that butterflies and everybody loves. Um, so if you have a corner that you are just trying to swallow up, because like I said, it goes in small, it is an expensive shrub but boy, is it awesome. Once it gets like that, it just, it'll swallow a corner. It'll just take out an area and it's just awesome. And then it turns yellow in the, oops, it turns yellow uh, in the fall. And it's just a, it's just a great producer. It's a great shrub. I put this in as many places as possible that have the space for it. Uh, Cause like I said, it's a butterfly magnet. It's a butterfly host plant. It's a full sun to part shade, even in the shade, uh, you just don't get as many flowers. Um, it's a great, again, for that, that, that wood line, if you're trying to fill out a wood line or you have a big corner, you're just trying to swallow up. It's an excellent one. Uh, red buckeye tree, small tree, well, medium tree, I guess, 30 feet, 20 to 30 feet high. Um, also gorgeous. Also host plant, also butterfly magnet. This is definitely a tree though, and not a shrub. <clears throat> The chokeberry, the aronia, this is a great shrub, spring flower, summer berry, fall color. I work these oftentimes into those hedgerows that I was talking about. Um, cool for just berry production, great for the birds. The birds don't go at them right away. They're for, the, um, they're for that later winter. Birds are funny. They kind of eat through things over the course of the season and they know the fruits that will be there late in the winter. That will that will hold on, that will dry up, um, and they and they go after those. They go after those later on. Atlantic white cedar. Now there here's a here's a caveat with cedar. Cedar is something that I love. Cedars are absolutely beautiful with their exfoliating bark. Everything else they can grow in, an, in wide varieties of soil, um, but average and dry, it will absolutely handle. It's a great native uh, evergreen. And we have lots of native evergreens, but not so many trees. Here's the thing with the cedar. You can't grow it with a service berry. You can't grow it with a hawthorn because they share a, it's a relatively benign disease, but they share a disease, cedar apple rust. So if you want to have those amelanchia, that service berry, you can't have the cedar. Or if your neighbor has a cedar and you have a service berry, that may be an issue as well. And you'll get uh, you'll get service berries that actually look like the close-up of the coronavirus. They'll have like all these little things sticking off of them. It just doesn't make the plant, doesn't kill the plant and doesn't make the plant any less awesome in the fall. It doesn't make the flowers any less beautiful, but it does render the berries pretty much useless to us. <clears throat> so like I said, those cedars, they can be, you know, they fit nicely in the landscape. When let go, they get very tall. When let go, they are not as compact and thick as, and beautiful as we may want in our little landscape. <clears throat> Clethra, another one. If you see this, chances are it's my landscape. Love this one. You grows in wet areas. So if you have a moist area, grows in full shade, but does well in um, 
part sun, not necessarily full sun. I wouldn't throw it on the south side of the house, but I would put it on the east side and let it get, you know, that first portion of the day, um, you know, right up until noon, one o'clock is fine. Beautiful, sweet smelling flower. Like I talked about with the magnolia, I throw this in places where I want to have that, that summer breeze kind of blow by and catch people off guard because it will carry this fragrance, absolute pollinator magnet, great yellow fall color. So I love mixing it with viburnums that turn red because then this turns bright, bright gold, uh, but super fragrant, um, one, wonderful shrub, average to wet soils usually uh, will work best. I've seen it live in dry, but it's not super happy and dry. Um, and then it, there's the the white, and then there's also a pinky red, depending on the colors that you like. <clears throat> and then there's the alnifolia, which is a dwarf. This one will take that takes it a lot drier. This is kind of a mountainous, um, mountainous in that it doesn't mind that that dry, rocky uh, soil as long as it's high in organic matter. So it will grow in in a really tough area. <clears throat> but it's not as upright. It's kind of a, it's a lower sprawler. Fothergilla, another favorite. However, the bunnies like this one. So especially if you put it in small, um, this has happened to me a couple of times. I put in a small one in the fall and the bunnies just eat it down over the winter. It comes back, but they just, they do all my pruning for me. This one's got a really cool bottle brush flower before it leaves out early or mid spring, like right around dish now, I guess. And then it has these bluey, bluey tinged leaves. Uh, and then it turns a full sunset in the fall. So it, like it blooms in the spring early. Interestingly, uh, it's a great early pollinator plant, but it has funky blooms early in the spring. Um, where not a lot is blooming yet. And then it's got awesome, awesome fall color. So I, as you can see here, which I am just a huge fan of. Lo love this one, but especially if you're putting it in small, be careful because the bunnies like this one too. If you have deer, you may want to also kind of cage it up, uh, especially either in the winter or at least in that first winter until it gets woody. Um, it can get large on you. The uh, the straight species, as they say, the, the straight native um, will get to be about an eight by eight shrub, but it is easy to prune and I keep all mine at about say six feet, uh, a nice six foot compact shrub. Uh, and they all look, they just, they just look great. Takes pruning well. And uh, I can keep it looking like the dense little nursery specimen that I wanted. <clears throat> Ilex glabra. This is our native kind of boxwood alternative. This is our holly, our native holly. It's got these great boxwood leaves. It's resistant to most anything. Um, pollinators love the little flowers, which you can't necessarily see. Birds love the berries, which are great. <clears throat> this right here, this shamrock, um, can you don't if you're going to put it close to your house, don't put it anywhere where snow falls, because if the snow falls on it, it just splays real easily. Um, however, it's very easily pruned and it does it does come back. But the, if, you, if you plant the Ilex shamrock, it looks great. It does need pruning and you may need to either protect it or tie it for the winter if you're, if you're in a heavy snow area or a heavy snow kind of falling off your roof area so it doesn't get crushed. The Ilex reticulata, winterberry, great average to wet soils, wants the full sun. This is one that I put mid to back of bed because it doesn't look like anything until fall. So this is one of those that it's just like, it's there and it's just doing its thing and it's just green. It's just green in the background. Uh, it gets to be, a lot of them get to be like six feet tall. Again, very, very receptible to pruning, which is a good thing um, if, if you have like a, a smaller bed, but this is one that you just kind of keep in the background and then late, late fall, while the leaves are still on it, it gets those red berries. And then you get that hard frost, all the leaves fall off and the berries stay on and the berries persist well into winter. So you get those red berries, um, which are just which are just great. And they add that winter color and they add that late winter food 
uh, for the birds. They don't jump on it right away. Mountain laurel. This is one that everybody tries and many people have a tough time with. This is one that grows like a weed in the woods in central and western mass. Um, so it's not that it can't grow here. It's that we put it in environments it doesn't like. We put it in very organic depleted soils. It wants organic rich soil. It wants to have a leaf mulch put down on it, not a wood mulch. It does not, it wants to have decomposing matter around it. It wants to have part shade. Um, so, you know, six hours, four to six hours of sun um, is, is great for it. Uh, it also, like the, like the native roadie, wants to be leggy. It's not going to grow in that beautiful little ball that you bought it in all the time. So know that it's going to get big and it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some legs on it. Um, if, you have, if you have an older home currently, chances are you might have one that's big and it's leggy. Um, and if it's lasted, if it's lived that long, then that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. This is a great shrub with very cool flowers and it's an excellent evergreen. Um, but people want it to behave like it did on day one. They want it to stay a puppy forever and they don't stay puppies forever. Um, they, they grow up, they don't, or, or Janet, they don't stay kittens forever. <laughs> so, um, they, they do, they do grow up and they, you know, and that's, that's okay. And they are beautiful, but they, they're not these, these perfectly, uh, pruned things. You can see, you get these gnarled trunks, just like with the roadies. So this is something that you put into a woodland garden and you can either put it in, even the dwarf versions, you put it in, but know that if, if ultimately this is gonna be a long-term garden, it's gonna get big and it's gonna get woody and it'll eventually kind of swallow things up. <clears throat> but when, when in mass, if you go out to Norcross, Norcross Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, in, so I, don't know, I guess that's central mass. I can't remember exactly where it is, but they have a massive, just gorgeous uh, Calmia stands out there. I went out, I was out there. That's where Dan Wilder works. That's where we went on that walk that I told you about uh, last week when we talked about all things native and all things climate change. Um, and he just took me through the woods and we just saw these, these Calmia stands. It was too early when I was out there because it was before the season started. Um, and then he just sent me pictures of those stands in bloom and they're just phenomenal when they do their thing. Uh, sheep's laurel is the lower, smaller version of the, um, of the, of the Calmia. This is that I mean, here you can see it's growing on power lines. This is in its native environment, but this is like if you have that uh, dryish, they want that organic matter, evenly moist, we'll say, soils. Um, again, just like the roadies, they want acidic soil. So you, if you have the evergreens, if you have the oaks and you have the sun, then you could get something like this going. In mass, it would be beautiful. On a slope, gorgeous, absolutely. Um, or through a sunny bed, down a path. If you have a long garden path, again, just gorgeous to have it there because you have the evergreen and then you just get these beautiful little pink flowers. So if you're somebody who's in the garden and has the time to appreciate the color, the texture and the evergreen of all this, absolutely one to look into. Physocarpus, another favorite of mine, the nine bark. So many colors, so many everythings, exfoliating bark. Um, spring flower and fall color, like, wow. Most of the physocarpus now have like, not, not now, there's the, the green version and there are the red versions. And there's a lot of the red versions. There's one, I think it's called like Little Devil, which is the, the responsible replacement for the barberry. Um, it, cause it's got, it's got little tiny leaves and it grows in a similar shape. It's the non-invasive replacement for your barberry if you're a barberry lover um but that having that spring flower and that that um bronze we'll call it foliage or merlot foliage um is great i love to repeat that so like if you have that and then you have you know dark leaf things like uh hoopras or your actia brunette you know, some or um non-native if you go with the 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 ligularia brit marie 
but repeating some of that bronze or that, you know, that, that deep color, that maroony color um, throughout within the leaves is just awesome. And then the fall color on these is just spectacular. I mean, it's just, it's just great all the way around adds color to the bed. This is a great one. If you have us like on the sunny side of your house, if you're trying to put something in front of like your electric boxes, that's easy to prune, like the utilities, like that this will grow on the sunny side of the house. It will be gorgeous. You can push it aside to read the meter or you can prune it easily. Like you will still kind of see the meter, you know, but if you're not, you know, and yes, in the winter you will, it'll just be sticks, but it's, it's one that I can, I like to use in situations like that because it kind of hides the, hides the ugly when I'm out, when everybody's out and about during the summer and then the winter, it's just kind of like, yep, yeah, it's there. You know, yes, you can see, you can see what's behind there. Every house has it. Like, let's not, you know, let's not, you know, fake it, but this is easy to prune rather than trying to put a bunch of evergreens in front of there, which are harder to prune. And again, it's just, it's just gorgeous. That exfoliating bark though, putting it in a garden garden and not using it just kind of in a random area to have the color, the flower and the exfoliating bark is just awesome, um, you know, all year round. <clears throat> the fragrant sumac, you're starting to see this a lot in um, parking lot plantings. I use this uh, on, um, on some of my beach hillside plantings. It just goes. It just goes and it's gorgeous and it's indestructible. And you may, well, once it, if it really likes where it is, you're gonna have to prune the crap out of it because once it takes off, it just goes and goes. Um, so, you know, it'll come small, let it go small and, and, and fan itself out. Don't put a whole bunch in there thinking because it'll, once it's happy, it'll go. Um, and it's, but it is, it's just, it's just beautiful when it takes over. It takes very little aside from keeping it pruned to this area that you want it in. Um, it's like no maintenance, full sun, average to dry soil. I put it right on the water on the beach pretty much. So it'll take the wind, it'll take the salt. Uh, it definitely takes that abuse. But like I said, it gets, it can get, get away from you. Um, back to the pawpaw, just as, as we now that we're out of edibles, but you can see this, I put this in here because of the grove. You can see how it grows. There's the parent plant and there's all the little trees around it. Pawpaw is fun. Like I said, part shade to shade. It's a good one with that fall color and the wonderful fruits, but it's just, I mean, it's a beautiful tree and it doesn't get any love and it really doesn't, it's underused, I think, in the landscape. And it was so prolific here, but then it just went away. <clears throat> Woody's for dry sites. We're just cranking right along, but I think I'm doing okay on time. I'm going to go a little bit over. I'm sorry. Bearberry. This is a great one for a dry site. This one is relatively indestructible. This one wants to be neglected a bit. This one I in usually interplant or plant right along with that um, fragrant sumac, similar area. You will see this sometimes growing on the sunny hillsides along the, um, along the highways and the off ramps. Sometimes you'll see this as a blanket. It's a ground cover. It's, a, it's an evergreen pretty much ground, ground cover um, with this wonderful little flower and the berries. You know, it's great. The problem with this one is people love on it too much. Don't love on it. Give it some nice, you know, sandy organic soil because it doesn't want to stay wet. Um, so it does, though, you don't want to keep it in, in moist, moist soil. It wants to, it wants to drain, but it wants to be relatively, um, so it wants that organic and quick draining soil. So sandy, say a real sandy compost would be perfect way to start this and then just forget about it and just let it do its thing and it'll just make this mat of flowers, berries and evergreen wonderfulness. Sweet fern. This one makes me think of my childhood. This was in the sunny little, a little sunny spot on the, I used, when I used to go play in the woods along the path, there was this one little pocket of like all this sun uh, and a quick, quick draining full sun area. Um, just a, it's a super cool plant. It's a super hardy plant, not a super sexy plant as far as things go. But if you have a sunny slope, uh, if you've ever touched sweet fern or smelled sweet fern, it's absolutely delicious. 
Um, there are a bunch of native uh, indigenous recipes for sweet fern. It's actually good for you. Um, but it is, it is a relatively indestructible plant, wonderful native, great for like a real sunny site with crappy soil, um, holds back a hillside. Uh, once, the, once the roots get going, will kind of grow in its own little colony uh, as, as it begins to take. So if you have just kind of this area or you want to kind of intermingle it with other really like sunny site things that will take abuse, this is, this is definitely a great one. Uh, I don't mind the shape and the everything of it. It's, I found it hard to sell in the past because people will say, well, look at this picture that I have up now and be like, meh, you know, cause it's just, there's so much more, but this is one that like, again, once it gets going and if you keep it, if you do kind of keep it pruned and, and love on it, you can get it to look really nice as you can see here. So if you have that dry slope that you just want to fill in, uh, and you are an active gardener, then it won't get necessarily leggy on you and you can keep a pretty cool sweet fern um, blanket going. Black huckleberry, another good one, great bird one, um, edible. You've probably seen exactly this driving to the Cape. This is, this is the Cape view. If you've ever been to the Cape, this is what you see. Sandy, acidic, organic soil. Just kind of goes, but it's got that great color. Creeping juniper, again, with that sandy dry site, quick draining soil, because it doesn't like to be soaking wet all the time. But if you have just the right of organic matter in there, and the reason I press on this is the organic matter holds the moisture in the soil. Doesn't keep the soil wet, it holds moisture in the soil. So even if we get like a little tiny rain like we got today, that moisture will stay in the soil for days and days and days, if not weeks. 1% of organic matter is 20 to 25,000 gallons on a one acre property of moisture held in the soil, of water in the soil, just 1% of organic matter. So if you get your soil tested and you're at 1% and you can raise it to 2%, you've now increased the water holding capacity of your soil. What does that mean? That means healthier plants. That means more soil life. That means less irrigation. It means better plant health all around and water conservation. So yes, even junipers want to have that situation, but once these guys get going, they're tough, they're tough to pull out, they're tough to kill. They're just awesome all around. If you are a heavy urban dweller, Juniper is something you sometimes need to be cautious about because depending on where you are in the city and what your environment is like, it can be a, a hiding place for rats. So if you are in an area with a rat problem, then you may want to not create a blanket like this. Doesn't mean you can't have a few, but having a blanket like this may not be the thing to do. <clears throat> Red cedar, gorgeous, upright. Again, if you're having amelanchia, if you're going to put amelanchia on your property, this, the service berry, don't plant this or vice versa. However, this is a great full, say, uh, arborvitae alternative. Um, this is the way, the way it grows, the, it's upright, it's fullness, it's full sun, it's dry, it's bulletproof. Uh, <clears throat> so once it's, once it's established, it can be neglected. The more love you give it, the fuller and, and everything it will be. Otherwise, it will get a little, a little more sparse and a little thinner uh, if you let it grow out. Great berries, which the birds absolutely love. They're, they're fatty and uh, they're fatty rich, waxy covered. Um, <clears throat> so this is just, this is just an excellent plant uh, all around. However, depending on what you're trying to grow, again, anything apple-y, any, most berries are not going to like this. But it's a gorgeous tree and or shrub. Bayberry, super tough to kill. Another wonderful berry shrub, semi-evergreen, easy to prune, average to dry soils, full sun, wonderful recipes that can be made with its, with its berries, with its leaves. Grows in all sorts of sites and all sorts of conditions, but can definitely take the abuse, but again, can be kept. Um, relatively shapely. However, you're going to see like in this picture or this picture right here, 
you see that it's going to like it's going to want to leaf on the ends and then bury out. That's what it wants to do. So just respect the the nature of the shrub and don't ask it to do things. Don't try to make it look like a holly because it doesn't want to necessarily look like a holly. It wants to have its leaves out there and they'll stay semi evergreen and beautiful for you. Um, but it, it does get these clusters of berries on the inside. Pitch pine if you want trees. If you want trees, if you want evergreens, if you are in that sandy, salty air, uh, quick draining, uh, organic soils, and even mildly organic soils, because here it's right on the beach, there's not a whole lot of organic matter there. Take the salt, take the acidity. It is a good one, um, but it uh, the pitch pine definitely has it, you know, has its look, as you can see here. So it's not going to look like it did when you bought it at the nursery. But if you have a site, an open site or whichever, this will take the wind. This will take that abuse uh, in, those, in those high wind areas, in those poor soil areas. Staghorn sumac. This is one we see everywhere along the roads, but this is actually a good one. Again, if you're a forager, lots of wonderful recipes for this. Great for birds. Birds absolutely love it. It's a late winter food for birds. Um, with these wonderful red clusters and that gorgeous fall color. And then all those leaves die back and it just turns to sticks. Uh, but that is fine because it doesn't get crushed in the snow and it doesn't get crushed by the winter. So you just kind of let it go. But the staghorn sumac is, is a great one if you have an area to put a few. Winged sumac is not winged euonymus, which is an invasive. Winged sumac is a totally different animal, similar ash look, um, but is, is the native and is a great one. I'm kind of, I know I'm running late, so I'm trying not to spend too, too much time. Um, the three tooth kintifolia, excellent one, low grower, crappy soil, full sun. Yep, loves it. It's a, it's a beauty and it kind of grows in these little clusters. So average, average to dry soil, again, with the high organic matter. Why do I keep saying high organic matter? That's what these guys evolved with. That's what almost everything evolved with. And that's what we've done. That's why so many people can't get natives started because our soils are too sterile. There's not enough life. There's not enough air. There's not enough organic matter. We need to stop squeezing all the air out of them with compaction. And we need to keep them airy and fluffy and just let these plants do what they want to do. Yellow root. You either love it or you hate it because again, like the sumac, once it gets going, boy, does it get going. However, if you have a shady area, this, uh, this will get going. Great uh, habitat value, but again, it can be aggressive. Gorgeous though, when it gets going, you can see in this border planting, like once you do it, if you can kind of manage it and just let it do its thing, it's absolutely beautiful. Once it's doing its thing, super low maintenance, Average, average to wet. I don't know that it goes super dry. Uh, you can check me on that though, if you ever look it up. Um, average to wet sites though, uh, does really well. And it's just got a beautiful leaf, beautiful color. It's just awesome. <clears throat> Sweet crab apple, things for just kind of funky sites. If you wanna have that bloom crab apples, we do have native crab apples. And crab apples are, you can, you too can have that crab apple. It will be in bloom now, you know, which I love. Bog rosemary, I don't know if you've ever seen this at Weston. This is one that they, they bring in a few of them. Wants high organic matter, high organic, high acidic, high water table. So if you have a dry meh site, this is not for you. Go to the sheep's laurel and you'll get a similar effect. With a, with a more drought tolerant. <clears throat> but this one is just, when it takes, it's absolutely beautiful, but it is tough to get established. I don't always knock it out of the park with this one. Um, so if you have the patience and you're willing to give it a shot, it's a great one because when it's going, it's gorgeous. But I will just let you know that I do not always knock it out of the park with that one. Uh, Epigenia repens, it's a nice little creeping semi evergreen ground cover with wonderful little white flowers. Very delicate, very woodland, very, if you are not in your landscape, you will miss it. So this is 
This is one if you know if you're going to be there in your woodland garden uh, to notice it. Otherwise, I don't know that I'd go hunting for it. It's a great evergreen. I mean, it's a great native. So if you want to put it there for habitat value, perfect. But this is uh, it's it's fleeting and it's just so delicate that you might miss it. Um, but average to dry soils does not take a does not need a lot of love. Box huckleberries. Great low evergreen with the fall color, <clears throat> the spring flower. And then we will round out with all of our vines. We do have wonderful vines, wonderful native vines. The trumpet creeper, hummingbird, magnet, pollinator, magnet, great vine, pretty strong because it's a woody vine. Also, very aggressive in the garden. So that's something that you need to uh, be wary of because once it just starts, it'll, for instance, I had one on a site and the, it was too much for the client. So we took it out and it's now like four years later and it's still trying to, with the roots that got left behind, it's still putting up roots throughout the garden. I'm still kind of fighting it back. So you can't just plant this willy nilly um, and if you try to take it away and it's not ready to go, it will, it will stay with you. However, if you have the space, if you have the attention to kind of keep it in its box, or you can box it out even a little bit to keep the roots from running, um, it's, it's just a, it's a wildlife magnet. It's absolutely gorgeous, <clears throat> uh, when it, when it goes, but it's kind of like a wisteria in that it's, it's strong and a it can be a little thuggy. Um, but like I said, I really, when it, when you plant it and when it can do its thing, it's absolutely amazing. Dutchman's pipe, great leaves. If you've seen it, if you've ever planted it, if you have it, the leaves are everything. It's all, it just shades everything out. The leaves are everything. The flower is oftentimes missed by most, pe most people. Uh, it is a pollinator and Lepidoptera magnet though. Uh, the caterpillars love it. So uh, it, it does its thing. It's great shade vine and it's a great shading vine. It is also not so aggressive that it's going to pull anything down. It's the biggest thing with the trumpet vine. It's the biggest thing with wisteria. Very strong and they can pull it down. And they can pull your house down. They can pull your trellis down. I do not suggest putting any of these vines uh, directly on your house. Always give your vine something else to grow on. Uh, you don't want to hold moisture to your house. You don't want to necessarily invite insects directly to your house. Uh, so put some sort of a trellis structure and try to keep like at least three inches off the house for air circulation. So you're not holding moisture to, to the home. Honeysuckle, I suggest everybody have one somewhere. Put it somewhere. Uh, if you have a sunny location and, and you can grow it because it is a, it's a hummingbird magnet, it's just beautiful. It's fragrant. It's just a, it's an awesome, easy native shrub. So just beautiful little flowers that the hummingbirds love. Virginia creeper. This is the one they are now taking off all the buildings in, uh, um, what's that? In the, like the, in the, in the Fenway area, in the, in the um, down, down by uh, the Emerald Necklace, the Landmark Center, all the buildings down there were covered in this. A lot of the college buildings were covered in this. They're taking it off. Not a bad thing to grow on your building. Great uh, shade. However, like if left too long on masonry, not a good idea. Great on a trellis. Great grower, great fall color. Um, when, when left to its own devices, this is garden in the woods. It becomes a ground cover. It grows up things, it grows across things, it grows in sun, it grows in shade. Uh, it has excellent berries for birds, which is wonderful, and there's the awesome fall color, and it plays host, uh, host to, can't even tell you now. If you recognize that caterpillar, that's great. I'm sorry, I totally just blanked on the name of the, the caterpillar. <clears throat> Fox grape not grown that often, but you often find it in the wild. It is just our native wild grape that, uh, that grows out there. 
can be can oops can be tamed and it just is a good one if you're again if you're just kind of playing with native edibles you know that's a fun one can't really put it on your house or anything like that i have planted it i i do grow it the grapes are great that's why i grow them um but as far as like multiple use with this vine not so much american wisteria again give it something to grow on not your house less detrimental and everything than the Japanese wisteria, not as thuggy, but also not as flashy and dramatic. It's a little more, just like, like I mentioned before, in the Northeast, we're a little more understated. The American wisteria is a little more understated than the Japanese wisteria, which is extremely showy um, and has a, a super long blue time, bloom time. However, it is not one to shy away from if you have a pergola, if you have a trellis and you have a sunny area and you want wisteria, this would be the one I would suggest because it is beautiful. Um, and it does provide all the everything of the wisteria. It just doesn't have all the, the flash of the Japanese hybrids. And that does it for today. And I thank you so much for joining me once again on a Sunday. I think I went way over and I have appreciate your patience with me. Um, and if you have any questions, I would like to answer any and all of them. If not, that's where to find me if you have any questions later that you either don't want to ask now or you don't think of until later. You can contact me at any time. Some of you already have. Trevor, I have a question um, on okay. that critical um, root zone. Can, mm -hmm. Are you supposed to mulch on top of that critical root zone? Can, you can is that a that's fine? Is that a, and is that where you would fertilize the tree? Is within that critical root zone? Um, you want to yes, you want to fertilize the tree, uh, yes, within the critical root zone, especially on the outer edges. You don't want to fertilize the tree near the trunk ever. You want to fertilize oh. the tree in the drip line, and if you are nurturing your soil with compost and leaf mulch chances are you will not necessarily need to fertilize your tree. If you are looking to build the, uh, the life within your soil, then uh, like, like we said, like the plant tone, uh, organic plant magic, certain inoculants and compost teas, um, things like that will boost the life in your soil. And then if you compost and leaf mold mulch those areas, you'll have a real robust soil in that area and you won't even need to fertilize anymore. But when you're fertilizing okay, your tree, you want to do it in that in that um, in the it, within the drip line, but not at the trunk, because the drip line. If you if you notice a tree, and maybe you know this, and I'm sorry if I'm being redundant, but the tree's branches they're designed to drop all the water out at the tips of the roots so the tree can drink. It's not just a a, a, a haphazard design. It's designed to shed all that water so the tree's roots usually go out to at least the edge of where the branches are. That's the drip line. So you want to be, say, you know, with either in the outer drip line, or I would go three, depending on the size of the tree, you know, maybe three feet in or whatever, but you don't, the, nothing really happens at the trunk. Water, water comes down the trunk. That's what the bark's for. Bark leads water down the trunk. It's another way for the, comes down the branches, runs down the branches with surface tension, then follows the bark down to the base. It's a way for the tree to collect water. But the majority of everything happens mid root zone out to the drip line. Thank you. You got it. Any other questions? All right. Well, Lola, thank you for visiting. <laughs> and guys, you've been awesome. <clears throat> and uh, I look forward to seeing you either on our Thursday call, um, which is great. And I look forward to seeing you then and, and maybe at some other point in time. So thank you so much for your patience and your time. Take care, guys. Thank you. That was great. Bye, Trav. Thank you. Lola does not want you to stop. She's like hitting me. <laughs> Good night, all. Thank you.